We changed the world. We knew that we needed allies, not to stand with us or behind us, but in front of us to soak up ammo. Considering that World War II was the most devastating war in human history, the Europeans needed a little bit of an inducement to take that role. So we came up with this idea called globalization. We would send our Navy out to patrol the global oceans so that anyone could go anywhere at any time and interface with any partner and access any commodity in any market if in exchange you would join us in the Cold War. And that created the world that we know. That's NATO, that's the Japanese alliance, that's the World Trade Organization. All of it was rooted in that security idea. And it generated the longest period of peace and prosperity in human history, and then we won. One guy had this idea, George Herbert Walker Bush, the president of the time. He's like, why don't we take this alliance, the greatest achievement in human history, and play it forward? Not just for another generation or two of American preeminence, but to remake the human condition. He was the perfect guy for that job. Not only was he the president at the time, and not only had he served in the White House for eight years before as VP, but he had run the CIA, he had been in Congress, he had been ambassador to China, he had been in the business community. His Rolodex was the world's largest. He knew everyone, he understood how it all fit together. He was the right person at the right time, in the right job. So of course we voted him out of office. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea. A new world order where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind, peace and security, freedom and the rule of law. And instead of having that open, honest conversation with ourselves, we started down a different path where we became ever more internally focused and narcissistic. Because we had never invested our economy in globalization. It was a bribe. If we had done it for ourselves, no one would have joined. And so in this series of ever more internally focused narcissistic conversations, we elected a series of presidents culminating with the current one that took us further and further from that vision, or even the conversation about the vision. The biggest difference between Trump and Biden from an international economic point of view is that Trump would put his policies on Twitter. Biden takes those same tweets, runs them through a grammar checker, puts them into the bureaucracy so they outlive him. From my point of view, they're almost the same guy. I think the best place to start is with the money. This is net worth in the United States by age bracket. And it's a story you all instinctively understand. As you get older, as you get better at your jobs, as you start new businesses, your net worth goes up. But in North America, the real delta happens at ages 50 and 55. Because at age 50, your single biggest expense, your youngest kid, becomes someone else's problem. And the money that you save by being an empty nester you used to pay down what is typically your second biggest expense, which is your homestead. And by 55, on average, on this continent, that has been paid down as well. So from 55 to 65, your expenses are under control, your income's at an all-time high, and that delta, that's 70% of private capital, globally. That's literally where the money is. That's the tax base, that's the investment funds, that's everything. Stalin changed that. In the pre-Stalin world, we had a demographic structure that looked like this. Here are the South Koreans at the dawn of globalization. Typical pyramid, you've got children at the bottom, young adults, mature adults, retirees at the top, men on one side, women on the other. Mortality tends to build it into a pyramid. And this is a very specific economic model because whenever you have a large number of people below 45 relative to the rest, it's all about consumption. You're raising kids, you're building homes, you're at the start of your lives, your experience is relatively low, your remuneration is relatively low, your skill set is relatively low, but there's all this consumption. What you lack are people aged 55 to 65, the people who generate the capital and the tax base. So systems like this are relatively low value add, they tend to be high inflation because of all that consumption. But the government is limited, education is limited, technology is limited. But Stalin, globalization, changed the way we lived. This is the perfect system for an agricultural network. When you live on the farm, kids are free labor, you have as many of them as you can put up with. But with globalization, 
we all suddenly were in the same pool together and we had the opportunity to specialize. And when you specialize and you go into things like manufacturing and services, none of those jobs are on the farm. And as you move from the farm into the city, you discover that kids are no longer an economic asset, they're a burden. And two generations on, we look like this. Wildly different economic model. Lots of people in that 55 to 65 block. Folks that are not just capital rich, but skills rich. The most productive workers humanity has ever seen. But they are no longer consuming as much because there aren't a lot of kids. So that stuff has to be exported, but the value of those products is massive. The volume of the tax base is massive. You get great infrastructure, you get great education, mid-career training, amazing government services. But it's a one-way trip. The Koreans are not the only ones who have done this. We've all gone from the Korea of the 50s to the Korea of now at different starting points, at different speeds. Everyone has their own little story. But we're all on the same highway here. And in the next few years, the Koreans will lead us into whatever's next. As that bulge that's currently capital rich and skills rich and paying taxes ages into mass retirement and it all goes away. A few years from now, the Koreans will have to figure out a new economic and political and social model that is not based on consumption or on production or on investment. I look at it, I have no idea because no country in human history has ever crossed that Rubicon. And the Koreans definitely will not be alone. All right, let's start bottom left with the Germans. Same situation as Korea for very similar reasons. This is their last decade as an industrial power. If you want a Beamer, get it now. You should probably get 10 years of parts because you're going to need those. Hop right, Mexico. Very different story here. When the Mexicans heard about globalization back in their 40s, like, oh, that's just another American security ploy. We're not falling for that. The rest of the world did, Mexico didn't. And so they didn't start urbanizing and industrializing until the wall fell. And they're like, well, shit, this is the only game left in town. So NAFTA happened. And they started industrializing and they started urbanizing. And since then, their birth rate has dropped by 60%. A couple things from that. Number one, if they keep aging at their current rate, they won't be in a German Korean style problem until 2080. That's a lot of time to figure out another path. Second, in the meantime, you've got a young demographic that is rapidly aging, which means you get this heavy activity of people in their 20s and 30s who are not weighed down by having nine kids. The consumption and the growth that comes from that is massive. We've seen this before. This is China in the 80s and the 90s. This is Europe in the 60s and the 70s. That's a minimum, minimum of 25 years of fantastic growth. And in the meantime, they do the low and the mid tier. We do the mid and the upper tier for manufacturing. It's the perfect partner by any number of measures. If there was one country on this planet that we wanted to have as a trading partner, Mexico is the one we want. And so this year, Mexico retook its position as our number one trading partner. They will not give that position up in our lifetimes. There are a lot of things about Donald Trump that I'm like, mm, after two, when it was done, how it was done, with who it was done, one of the great foreign policy successes of the last half century. Then there's us, kind of a chimney. A couple things going on here that don't really relate to the rest of the world. They're really homegrown. So number one, globalization was a bribe. We never invested our economy into it. So we didn't industrialize nearly as quickly as everyone else. Slower process. Second, a lot of elbow room in the United States. So we didn't go farm to city. We went farm to small town to suburb to city. And so the degradation in our birth rate was much slower than everywhere else. And it shows, if we keep aging at our current rate, we won't be in a German-Korean situation until 2070. Again, a lot of time to figure out something else. 